the gentleman said, are you okay? I said, no, sir, I'm not. I need to go to the hospital. It was creepy to know that that a perfect stranger could get access of such personal information. They say the best things in life are free, but you can give them to the birds and bees. I need money. That's what I That's what I want. Uh. Hi there, I'm Tom Natchu. Welcome to another episode of Fraud Squad TV. Can you imagine yourself being taken in by a scam artist? Most of us think it's impossible. We're too suspicious. We're too on guard for it to happen to us. Guess what? The millions of people that have been defrauded feel exactly the same way. Fraud affects everyone from all walks of life. It can happen to you because, most likely, you won't even see it coming. Fraudsters are like chameleons, and they're constantly adapting their scams. Stay tuned for this episode's stories and valuable tips. What percentage of insurance claims are fraudulent? 4%, 10%, 52%, or 87%? According to the National Insurance Crime Bureau, at least 10% of all insurance claims are either inflated or fraudulent. That leaves the industry to pay as much as $30 billion annually in fraudulent claims. And that money comes out of our pockets through higher insurance premiums. Throughout this series, we've heard the experts and victims alike tell us, if it's too good to be true, well then it probably is. Now, this phrase is particularly true in our next story, Counterfeit Products. You know that expensive watch or designer handbag that you can just pick up for a couple of bucks? Don't believe it. Not unless you're at a garage sale in Beverly Hills. You know, counterfeit products cost American businesses more than 200 billion a year and American workers 750,000 jobs. Now, this is according to the FBI and the US Bureau of Customs and Border Protection. Unfortunately, in this case, no one knew who the manufacturer was. No matter where I go now, I'm always looking for, for counterfeit products and stuff like that, and I ask questions now and make them accountable for their actions. Joe Pellegrino of Jacksonville, Florida, wasn't particularly interested in buying any sunglasses that day, but when he saw this popular brand at such a low price, he was tempted, and this temptation nearly cost him his vision. When I went into the gas station, uh, recognized a pair of sunglasses, that I wanted to buy, I was paying for gas. The gentleman went ahead and let me take the pair of sunglasses down to try them on. Well, the, the glasses that were actually the counterfeit ones, that, although they look very close to the genuine Oakleys, um, these were the ones that actually injured Mr. Pellegrino. Um, same name, same decals, same everything. Uh, the only problem is they're just not manufactured the same. When I tried to open them a little bit, it kind of like slingshot it into my eye. And after that happened, my eye started, I thought it was bleeding. The gentleman said, are you okay? I said, no, sir, I'm not. I need to go to the hospital. The doctor said that I had a corneal abrasion. When I knew that this was probably going to turn into a little bit more than just a poke in the eye, went in to retrieve the evidence, and he had him back on the shelf after they just poked me in the eye. And the people that are selling these products don't really want to know where they come from. They just don't want to know where that person got them from. And they're going to sell them as what they are and, and just, you know, wash his hands of everything that was before him. My eyes would be welded shut in the morning when I would wake up and physically pry them open. You, you never know what you're being sold. As simple as a pair of sunglasses, you could lose an eye. You never would think that by going in and paying for gas. Counterfeiters are not paying any taxes. They're not abiding by the laws and putting forth safe products, as a result of which the, count the counterfeiters are detrimentally affecting the reputation and the goodwill built up by companies that have worked very hard to have a good reputation. You're actually supporting organized crime. You're supporting terrorist financing. And the same counterfeiters 
that are bringing in the Gucci and Louis Vuitton bags very often are shipping in that same shipment the counterfeit pharmaceuticals, the counterfeit electrical products, and the counterfeit toys that have hazardous materials on them. Nowadays it's a growing problem, so products that we've seen that are counterfeit now apply almost to anything that's produced in this global marketplace. And what's, what we found is because copper is such an expensive commodity, the counterfeiters put in more insulation and less copper, so you see this smaller gauge wire which causes uh, overheating and uh, potential fire and shock hazards. What we're finding is virtually everything out there can and is being counterfeited. This kind of counterfeit bothers me, especially as a parent, a great deal. And here we have a toy that has not been tested at all. All toys in Canada that are sold have to be made on the insides with new material only. You're not allowed to use remanufactured material. We've dismantled these and we have found just about anything you can imagine that's been swept up from the floor of some factory in some foreign country, we have found on the insides of these. Uh, safety standards exist because products not built in compliance with them could pose a potential health and safety risk to the public. This is a pair of counterfeit Nike shoes. The box looks real, but it's not. The shoes look real, but they're not. There's no cushioning technology built into this shoe at all. So someone is going to use this, they're going to run on it, they're going to put weight on it, and it's going to affect their joints. They might not notice it immediately, but over a period of time, they're causing damage to their joints. When you collectively look at the job losses, revenue taxes, um, the products and the costs of enforcement, that it's in potentially in the hundreds of billions of dollars on a global basis. We're with our fraud expert, Craig Hannaford. In this particular case, the guy nearly lost his eyesight. Now, that's serious. Well, there are some really serious uh, consequences to buying these counterfeit products. So you've got to be careful. You know, everybody's probably been tempted to do that, but some of these things can have real safety issues. There's no question about it. Tell me about some of the safety issues you ran across over 25 years of law enforcement. I've seen cases where stores have sold fraudulent or counterfeit uh, extension cords, electrical extension cords. It seems so benign. What with with the actual safety symbol on it. And the problem with those is that they could actually cause a fire. And there have been cases where people's homes have burned down using one of these counterfeit extension cords. So instead of spending $3.99, you spend a buck ninety nine and you lose, and you your, lose house. your house. Craig's got some more ideas that you can use to prevent this type of fraud. Name brand products are not sold on tables on the street. Ask for the owner's manuals and manufacturer's warranties. If these do not exist or do not look official, it's a good chance that the product is counterfeit. Look for spelling errors in the packaging or instructions. Look for substandard quality. If the price seems too good to be true, the item is likely a counterfeit. Give us a few more minutes and we'll be back with more Fraud Squad TV. What percentage of global trade is in counterfeit products? Six, 19, 42, or 78%. Counterfeit products amount to 6% of global trade, and that's a huge amount of money. In North America alone, counterfeiting diverts more than $250 billion a year into the hands of criminals. It's not just the financial cost. As we saw in our segment, counterfeit products can leave you seriously injured. Identity theft occurs when your personal and financial information is stolen, and then new documentation, credit cards, and loans are created by the criminal. While they run off with your money, your credit rating takes a beating. Proving that you didn't steal the money is often very difficult. Now, according to the Federal Trade Commission, identity theft is the most reported fraud in America, representing 42% of all fraud-related crime. My name is Alina Litchfield. I'm 27 years old, and I was a victim of identity theft. Nothing makes me happier than to find out that a bunch of them are sitting around the local jail comparing notes about how I caught them. But it all started with my, my cell phone. Got a text message one day from, uh, from T-Mobile uh, thanking me for adding an additional line onto my credit. Then I got to thinking about that and started getting paranoid and I checked my credit and it was just, it was just a nightmare. I call it my big black book. Uh, my credit rating should have been at about 800. This is the impact on my scores. It starts out high, 
that starts going down to moderate and then to low. However, low has a whole nother page because they weren't done yet, so they just kept on going. Overall, everything totaled up together was uh, just over $8,000. This discovery led the local police to involve Barbara Glass, a specialist in identity theft crimes for the Portland Police. We began a follow-up investigation that uh, involved contacting the Postal Service in investigators. Somebody was what they call mailboxing, so stealing things from people's mailboxes, unlocked mailboxes. Mail had been not only redirected, but electrical bills, gas bills, those sorts of things were being changed into these victims' names, but to pay for uh, these criminals' services at their house. I know that they had my address, and you know, when it's late at night, sometimes I'd be at home by myself. I was very, I was scared, yeah, because I don't, I don't know these people. I don't know who they know. I don't know what they're capable of. Identity theft is taken very seriously in Portland, and quite often, the local police and special emergency response team, or CERT, will raid the house of a suspect to execute a warrant. Now, in this exclusive footage, Fraud Squad TV was invited to attend one such ID theft raid. Could be some really unattractive, somewhat naked people in handcuffs. It's about 4.20 in the morning, and we are the search team. I don't think that they're expecting any guns, but anything is possible. Every time there's a surprise, though, there's going to be something that's going to be entertaining. Sitting, waiting for it to happen, we hear the machinery coming down the street. It's like, go, 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 go. It was packed with stuff. We couldn't look in a cupboard or open a closet without having something related to fraud fall out on us. It was amazing. They were clearly getting ready to use that information uh, against other people. Out of the hundreds of cases I've investigated in the last five or six years, there were maybe three that weren't related to methamphetamine. They want to make money fast, so they're the ones that go out and do car prowls and steal mail and do burglaries. They usually don't work. Fraud is their job. Finding more methamphetamine is what they live for. Coming out. All right. The people who do these types of crimes, they're looking for the quick hit. We found reams and reams of papers that had handwritten notes. We call them profiles containing uh, victim information, victims' names, dates of birth, addresses. What they had done, what they hadn't done, what they had used, what they hadn't used. Oh, my goodness. Oh, 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 oh. Actually, paperwork of uh, other fraudsters I know. We also found computers, printers, monitors. And this was higher level of identity thief that we normally see. They're going to take us down. Gentlemen, we're going to do identity theft and computer software. I don't know anything about computer We don't have a Angel Thompson was denying involvement in any of the fraud or identity theft that was going on. And she was pointing the finger back at her mother, saying she's doing it all. She's the one who's responsible. I was aware of it, but I wasn't part of it. And it was not two seconds later, we opened a closet up, found a backpack that she identified as hers. And when we opened it, all of these notebooks with handwritten profiles that had other people's names and dates of birth and all their personal and financial information handwritten out over and over and over again. How can you continue denying that you're not part of it? And, and, and it was at that point that uh, she decided that uh, she didn't want to be nice anymore. And... After raiding the suspect's home, Officer Glass and her team found extensive evidence linking the residents of the apartment to identity material relating to Elena Litchfield. It probably took me about, you know, four or five months on the phone, mailing letters on the phone, mailing more letters on the phone again to successfully reverse all the charges. And now it was time for the district attorney's office to prepare their case against the women they began to refer to as the Thompson twins. But after examining the evidence they collected, they soon learned that Elena wasn't the only victim. 
I think we counted there may have been upwards of over 100 victims. The mother in the particular case agreed to a sentence of 75 months in prison and to pay restitution to the victims. The daughter is serving 45 months in prison and has also agreed to the restitution. Fraud Squad TV obtained the official mugshots of the fraudsters taken the day they were arrested. Now, for the first time, Elena was able to see the faces of the women who stole her identity, Debbie Thompson and her daughter, Angel. Oh, I've been waiting like a year to, to see what these women look like, and finally I get to see who did this to me. And... It's the mother. Oh, makes me sick that <laughs> they did that to me. You may have gotten away with it up to this point. You may get away with it for a little while longer, but eventually it will all catch up with you. Somebody will put it together. They'll figure out what you're doing. They'll figure out where you're at, and they'll come get you. They are going to pay a hefty price. I was only one of hundreds of people in this specific case. I finally got my name cleared up in the very end. It, it's a, it has a happy ending, so I'm very grateful for that. We're here once again with Craig Hanna for 25 years of law enforcement. It's been 25 years since I've known about a shredder. Now they're about 25 bucks. Maybe I should get one. Well, you know what? I think everybody should have one, and everybody should make a point of shredding all their personal information before it goes into the trash. Now, in this particular case, there is a retribution. Somebody got caught. That's a good thing. But you know there's some fraudsters out there with the information that they already got your numbers. They just haven't used them yet. What can I do then? Well, that's a really good point. Sometimes these fraudsters will steal your personal information but they may not use it for six months or for a year. That's why it's imperative for you to check your credit on a regular basis to make sure nobody is abusing your good name. And you can do that right on the web, right? Absolutely. Craig's got a few more tips that might just come in helpful for you. Check your credit rating on a regular basis to ensure that fraudsters have not opened accounts in your name. Shred any documents that contain personal information, such as your name, address, phone number, bank or credit card numbers. If you receive any calls or mail from companies indicating you have opened up a new account and you haven't, follow up and close them down. Make sure your mail is left in a secure mailbox and not easily stolen. In just a few minutes, we'll be back with more Fraud Squad TV. What percentage of people still throw away their credit card and bank statements without shredding them? 10, 40, 70, or 90%. 40% of people leave themselves vulnerable to identity fraud. Don't throw out documents that contain your personal information. Shred them, or you may find you'll become one of the millions of people who fall victim to identity fraud every year. Hi, I'm Naomi Joy. Learning the warning signs of fraud will go a long way to protecting you from it. Fraudsters will pressure you to spend money without giving you time to think. They'll tell you that the deal is a one-time offer and that you have to act now or you'll miss out and someone else will profit. They may even try to make you feel like you're part of a very select group, but they will very quickly go from being warm and friendly to cold and insulting if you don't give them what they want. If you learn to recognize the ways fraudsters take advantage of people, then you can beat them before they beat you. Don't be forced into any quick decisions that involve your money. Don't believe in easy money and I hate to say it, but sometimes greed can be a huge factor. Don't be blinded by it. Now, Fraud Squad TV it takes it to the street to hear more ways fraudsters have tried to get your money. Uh, I was in a, a banking area, and I was going to withdraw some money or deposit some money. And there was a guy standing in the area, and uh, he got a little pushy. He was trying to, we said, make a, a last-minute arrangement. And he had this check. and you know, could we make some sort of arrangement and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So the idea was that I somehow was able to, to put the check in for him. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I felt very pressured, but I didn't say no. So I did what he wanted and all the rest of it. And then it turned out that the guy was uh, a fraud. Well, if you're in a public area, I think, and you don't like what someone is putting to you, just stand up for yourself. And if there's people around, they would probably help you out as well, you know. Just just don't do it. You always want to help somebody, you know, but it's another thing for someone to, to push you into doing something you don't want to do. Well, my credit card was used <clears throat> in the eastern United States, one of the states, and to the tune of three or $4,000 and my credit card was still in my wallet and I had never lost it. 
and um, the bank, but the bank made it right. And it was identity theft, I guess. I don't know what else you'd call it. Well, it was somebody um, or, or people hacked into the company and um, their aff affiliates, their their system, and so um, my bank and um, their their company um, issued a, a, I guess, the equivalent of a recall for all their their credit cards and, and the people who have ever um, charged with any type of credit system. Then afterwards, I had to change all my information, and I've been extra cautious ever since. Well, I would say to um, carry small amounts, of, to, to carry cash on you if you can, um, to carry as the least amount of credit cards or debit cards with you at, at all times, and to um, to never have as the different types of information, personal information on you at the same time. Um, my story is I got scammed about 10 years ago. Um, my wife had uh, talked me into to joining a, like a modeling agency. And what they do is, I, I forget exactly how much money it was. I think they take like $300 or something and they say they're gonna give you these, do a photos of you and, and, and prepare a thing so that you have a, a booklet so that you can go to the, so that they'll get you work. You need that to get work. And I did that and never a call. And the, the, the place was called Holub. And I, apparently they, there was a lot of people complaining about them at the time. I found out later. And uh, I think they ended up going under. But um, they, they ripped a lot of people off for a lot of money. There's people who got ripped off for thousands of dollars. I just kind of got in and, you know, my, my foot in the door and that was it. And uh, I kind of said, you know, this isn't, this is nothing's going on here. So, and I got out. Any, anyone who's asking for money and they're not, able to give you work, um, if they want money up front before they can give you work, it's a scary situation, especially if you don't have a lot of money. Thank you for sharing your stories. By telling your stories, we just might prevent someone else from falling for the same scam. If you want to learn more about protecting yourself from fraud, or if you have a story to share, visit our website at fraudsquadtv.com. Let's fight fraud together. Isn't it amazing how quickly a half hour passes on Fraud Squad TV? There's a veritable treasure trove of information on fraud at our website, fraudsquadtv.com. We'd love to have you there because remember, we're all in this fighting fraud together. That's what I want